Now to move on to discuss the bones of the upper extremity, including the arm bone, the bones of the forearm, and the bones of the wrist and hand. The bones of the upper extremity are attached to the body through the pectoral girdle. And the bones of the upper extremity or limb include the humerus, the radius and ulna, the carpal bones, which are the wrist, the metacarpal bones, and the phalange bones of the hand. The humerus is the proximal bone of the upper limb, and it's the attachment of the upper limb to the rest of the body. The first bone of the upper extremity we'll discuss is the humerus. This anterior view depicts the humerus. At the proximal end is the head, which articulates with the scapula. There is also a greater and lesser tubercle. At the distal end of the humerus is the condyle, made up of two portions, the capitulum and the trochlea. Also at the distal end of the humerus is the medial epicondyle. The head of the humerus is the ball of the ball and socket shoulder joint, and this articulates with the glenoid cavity, which is the socket. On the proximal lateral edge of the humerus is the greater tubercle. This tubercle forms the outer margin of the shoulder, and its smooth impressions serve as attachment points for three muscles, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. These muscles are also involved in the rotation of the head of the humerus and abduction of the arm at the shoulder. The shaft of the humerus is a round cylinder shape and extends from the head of the humerus to the condyle. On the lateral border of this bone is the deltoid tuberosity, and this is the attachment for the deltoid muscle, which is involved in abduction, extension, and rotation of the shoulder. At the distal end of the humerus is the condyle, divided into two regions, the trochlea and the capitulum. The condyle of the humerus and the proximal portion of the ulna and radius bones form the elbow joint. The elbow joint includes two portions, the humeral ulnar joint and the humeral radial joint. The trochlea is the medial portion of the condyle that articulates with the ulna bone of the forearm. The capitulum portion of the condyle is where the humerus articulates with the head of the radius bone of the forearm. Here's another clinical challenge exam question. The humerus bone articulates with the scapula at the shoulder joint and both the radius and ulna at the elbow joint. Which of the following statements about the humerus bone is correct? A. On the proximal lateral edge of the humerus is the medial epicondyle. B. There is no muscular attachments on the shaft of the humerus. C. At the distal end of the humerus bone is the condyle where it articulates with the radius and the ulna. D. The humerus bone only articulates with the radius bone of the forearm, not the ulna bone. Or E. The medial epicondyle of the humerus articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Here's the answer to the question. This question tests your knowledge of the anatomy of the humerus and its articulations. The correct answer for this question was C. At the distal end of the humerus is the condyle, where it articulates with the radius and ulna. The first bone of the forearm we'll discuss is the radius, and it along with the ulna bone are depicted in this posterior view. At the proximal end of the radius is the head of the radius, near where it articulates with the ulna bone. There is also the neck of the radius. At the distal end is the distal extremity of the radius, along with the radial styloid process. As depicted in this image, the radius and ulna bone articulate with each other and are closely associated. The radius bone extends from the lateral side of the elbow to the thumb side of the wrist, making it the lateral bone of the forearm. At the proximal end is the head, where it articulates with the capitulum of the humerus. 
the shaft of the radius is towards the distal extremity. At the distal extremity is the styloid process which helps to stabilize the wrist. The medial surface of the distal extremity articulates with the ulnar head at the ulnar notch of the radius and this forms the distal radio-ulnar joint. And the movements permitted by the proximal radio-ulnar joint permit medial or lateral rotation of the radial head. The second bone of the forearm is the ulna bone. And it's depicted also in this posterior view. The ulna bone at the proximal end has the olecranon, which is the elbow. Also, it articulates with the radius at the proximal radial ulnar joint. At the distal end is the ulnar head and the ulnar styloid process. The ulna is the second bone of the forearm which lies medial to the radius, on the little finger side of the forearm. At the proximal end, the ulna bone is the olecranon process, and this forms the point of the elbow, and is the superior and posterior portion of the proximal epiphysis. On its anterior surface, the trochlear notch interlocks with the trochlea of the humerus. The ulna bone is roughly a triangle in cross-section, and along the shaft it is a fiber sheet, known as the antibrachial interosseous membrane. This fiber sheet connects the ulna to the radius. At the distal end of the ulna is the ulnar head with a styloid process on its posterior margin. A cartilage attached to this process isolates the ulnar head from the wrist bones. The upper extremity also includes the carpal bones or the wrist. The carpus or wrist is made up of a total of eight bones. The bones form two rows, the four proximal bones and the four distal bones. The bones in the proximal row are the scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, and the pisiform bone. The carpal bones in the distal row are the trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and the hamate. The carpal bones are involved in intercarpal joints that permit some sliding and twisting. The location of the first row of bones are, number one, the scaphoid bone is located at the lateral border of the wrist. The lunate is medial to the scaphoid and it articulates with the radius. The triquetrum is medial to the lunate bone and it articulates with the cartilage between it and the ulnar head. And the pisiform bone lies anterior to the triquetrum bone and extends the farthest in the medial direction. The positions of the carpal bones in the distal row are as follows. The trapezium bone is lateral and forms an articulation with the scaphoid. The trapezoid bone is medial to the trapezium and it's the smallest bone in this row. This bone has an articulation with a scaphoid bone. The capitate bone, which is the largest carpal bone located between the trapezoid and the hamate bone. And the hamate bone is the medial distal carpal bone. The following is a clinical note on carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome is a median nerve neuropathy believed to be caused by compression on the median nerve within the anatomical carpal tunnel. Within the carpal tunnel of the wrist are nine flexor tendons and the median nerve. Repetitive use or strain can lead to tendon swelling. The symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome include tingling burning sensations and pain in the thumb and fingers, and some patients report a loss of grip strength in the affected wrist. The treatment of carpal tunnel syndrome includes the use of splints and braces, massage therapy, medications, and in some cases, surgery to release the transverse carpal ligament. At the distal end of the upper extremity is the hand made up of the metacarpal and phalange bones. The palm of the hand is made up of five metacarpal bones and they articulate with the carpal bones of the wrist. 
the metacarpal bones appear similar to a long bone of the body, such as a femur bone. And the metacarpal bones are numbered 1 through 5, beginning at the thumb and moving laterally. Attached to the metacarpal bones are the phalanges. These bones are divided into three groups, the proximal, middle, and distal phalanges. The thumb, also known as the pollux, does not have a middle phalange. Instead, it's made up by a proximal and a distal phalange.